Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Lunch, uh, a couple of people asked me questions. One of the questions was, do I have a degree in counseling? Uh, because I run this business. Uh, no, I don't. I studied chemical engineering, which has nothing to do with counseling. Um, my experience is not in counseling. I've run several businesses that I knew absolutely nothing about. Um, I know, I know what good people are. So I hire people who are talented and talented and motivated. I don't particularly know what they do, but I know they're trying their hardest. Um, I don't know hardly anything about counseling, but I know a lot about business. So one of the things that I've found over time is that you're good if you're good in business, you'll be good in almost any business. Uh, Huh? No. It's all right. Second one is uh, this uh, one lady was asking me uh, as it related to sex inventory um, what goes on in some of the rooms in AA, and she mentioned in particular about guys with longer sobriety. <clears throat> doing what we call shooting baby ducks. Do you know what that is? 13 step, yep. So what uh, what do I think about that? I think it's deplorable, but I think that we have the wrong idea. Let me give you an example. We had a woman that joined my home group who was a former runner-up in Miss Minnesota. Striking woman. Um, and there was a guy with about 21 years, and about as soon as she hit the door, he was all over her like green on grass. And he was a guy who had hit out in a silo in someplace up in the northern Midwest and got crazy. And anyway, he got sober and... Uh, and he was fascinated with the idea of this really attractive lady. And uh, so he got her to go for a ride on his motorcycle, and pretty soon they were all involved. And I was talking to this friend, that I, well, a guy that I sponsor with about 20 years, and I was looking at that, and I said, you see that going on? And he said, yep. And I said, what do you think's going to happen? And he said, well, I'm not sure. And I said, I am. Here's what's going to happen. She's gonna, she came into Alcoholics Anonymous. Here's this guy. And he picked her off as soon as she came through the door. And she's gonna go riding around on his motorcycle and they're gonna go date and, and, uh, get intimate and do all of that stuff. And about 90 days from now, she's gonna go, well, that was fun. And he's gonna go, but I thought we were in love. And the one that got killed in the process was the long-timer. All right? She just walked away. She went, well, hell, that isn't what I want. And just changed her mind and left no emotional baggage in the process. And he's still recovering. Okay? So we're, we're all, do you know that there are predatory women? There are predatory men? And that's always going to happen in Alcoholics Anonymous. And everybody's going to, you know, in their search for intimacy, are going to take the easiest possible road to it. And they feel that newcomers are susceptible to that sort of persuasion, which in some cases is true, but you you never can figure out which one's going to get hurt. Uh, can we stop it? Um, some of it. Can we prevent it? No. No, because 
That's the way life is. Um, shouldn't long timers know better? Yeah. Um, I won't. I mean, I can't imagine trying to have a relationship with someone who hasn't been sober for a while. And oh, it's, which brings up a whole other thing, which is, should you have relationships in your first year? Sure, but it, don't call it a relationship. Call it compatible forms of insanity. <laughs> yeah, you you think, well, don't have sex. Everybody wants to have sex. So, you know, the whole idea about taking a bunch of randy, lonely individuals who come into Alcoholics Anonymous, you think they aren't going to get together? You're blowing smoke up your own butt. <laughs> That's going to happen. So what you try and do is help them survive it, okay? When people come to me that I sponsor and they'll say, so I shouldn't have a relationship, right? And go, go ahead. Just try not to hurt somebody in the process. And uh, you'll get over it, whatever it is. And that's the way it is. So what do I think about people picking off? I mean, we had a lady in my home group that's uh, sober about eight years that picked off a guy that had one month. I mean, so it isn't a one-sided deal. They see something they like, you know, we're all attracted to shiny objects. <laughs> Huh? So there you go. Um, so and now hopefully that answers those questions. Um, well, so we get awfully concerned about things that aren't going to make a hell of a lot of difference. Um, so that's inventory. Now, when you get your inventory done, there's a thing in the description of the fifth step that talks about illuminating every dark cranny of the past. That brings up something else which sometimes belongs on the end of your inventory, and that's called take it to the grave stuff. I'm sorry, did I hurt someone? Okay, it's not mentioned in the big book, incidentally, but it... it what is mentioned is that we have illuminated all these dark crannies, and one of those crannies is our behavior in certain areas. Almost all of the take-it-to-the-grave stuff has to do with some sort of sexual stuff. Um, you know there's only so many ways you can do that. Uh, unless you've gotten a laser and are going into outer space and you've figured out some way to make yourself feel better, um, almost everything's been done. One of the funniest things I've ever seen in an AA meeting was uh, at an AA meeting that was about sex inventory, and a guy jumped up in the middle of it and shouted, and anyone in this room that hasn't done it so who says they haven't done it with a farm animal is a damned liar. <laughs> so how the hell do you respond to that? I don't so um you know we all have our we all have our challenges <laughs> and um so normally the take it to the grave stuff is something that we consider to be abhorrent behavior it's usually sexual and um and it can it can be almost anything and uh and I can tell you that if you're nervous about that, that you've done something that you think is not normal or not typical or whatever, uh, it's reasonable to believe that half the people in this room have done it also. It's just 
you just can't do something that's never been done in that regard. So if you think you're totally unique in your sexual experiences, you are truly mistaken. Um, and, and you'll never really learn that until you be, join the fellowship of the Spirit and get to know, know some other people in Alcoholics Anonymous, and you'll be sitting in the middle of a bunch of people hanging around somebody's house, and they're all AA members, and they'll start talking about what you did, and all of them will have done it. So um, I don't care what you've done. And there's just nothing left to make it unique. So uh, if you've got to tell somebody about it, tell them about it in your fifth step. And usually, if you're going to fifth step with someone, first you need a closed mouth friend. I mean, I'd be a little careful about who you fifth step with. Most time people these days fifth step with their sponsors. Early on in Alcoholics Anonymous, people fifth stepped with clergymen, priests, rabbis, whatever. Um, today it's much more usual to fifth step with a sponsor. Make sure you trust your sponsor. Um, and then go ahead. Now, you've got all these things that you've written and you're prepared for a long talk. You know, inventories aren't just little things that you can crack out in 15 minutes. You know, I, have you ever heard this business about I, I wrote my inventory on the back of a matchbook? Huh? God, you must write small. Um, it generally, if I'm writing inventory, it generally takes me a, a month. Um, in and then, and that's because I'm dragging my feet, but it's still a lot. Um, and then you fifth step it. And fifth stepping really just has to do with reading it. And so you read it, and your sponsor will, or whoever's listening to it, if they have any facility with fifth stepping, will look for for messages in the middle of that. They'll look for character defects. They'll look for what's keeping us from God and um, and then bring that to your attention at the end of the fifth step so you know what to go with in six and seven. But fifth stepping, um, other than we're so afraid that we're going to offend somebody with our behavior when we spent all those years offending people with our behavior, um, uh, it seems a little silly. And if we're both on a spiritual mission, you know, explain that. I don't care if your sponsor knows it. Say I'm on a spiritual mission. Uh, I'm trying to get closer to God. The reason why I'm here is to is to uh, clean the house. And I would like you to listen to this. And the whole purpose is to get closer to God. And you can say that whether they understand it or not, no matter how long they've been sober, it's not it's not unreasonable for you to explain why you're there. Um, the first time I fifth step, uh, I I fifth step with Don Pritz, and I after the fifth step, I looked at him and I waited for him to respond. Now here's Here's my beliefs again. I expected him to look at me and say, um, I would really appreciate it if you don't come anywhere near my wife or children. And, um, and I would also appreciate it if you would not tell other people that I'm your sponsor. <laughs> and I think in the future we ought to minimize contact uh, and that's what I expected. And what, what he did was he got up and hugged me. Now, you have to understand that I wasn't that sober. And so having some guy get up and grab me? See, I'm still running around trying to protect my masculinity. And having some guy hug me? 
through me. I mean, I'm going, uh. And, uh, and then I got it. And he, uh, you know, he didn't tell me to go away. He didn't tell me that the, uh, what he had heard had altered our relationship. He, he just said, I'm delighted that you've done this. And now we need to move on. Um, so my belief was that the, the one I talked about originally, if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. And he really got to know me because I told him the deepest, darkest stuff in my life. And he knew the whole thing in the end, and he would still accept me. And my experience is in fifth steps that that happens. And we are always amazed that people are still willing to uh, to have relationships of some sort of friendships with us after they know what we've been through. And see, we think we're such terrible people. And one of those things about being damaged goods is laying your whole life out in front of someone and, and having them not reject you as a, as a result. It, that gives you hope, okay? And then go find the specifics, lay in the principal inventory, where you find the specifics and you can get rid of a whole lot of stuff at once. Um, so, do you have any questions about the fifth step? It's a fairly simple procedure. Okay? Yeah. Barb? When you do your fifth step... Yes. Should your um, person that you're doing it with, probably your sponsor, let you go through the whole thing? You know what I'm saying? Or, they, or should they comment on each thing that you're saying? Okay. Yeah. Um, when I listen to Fist Steps, we have a dialogue through it. Um, and, and for a couple of reasons. One of them is I couldn't get to the end and remember everything. Um, so, so as a practical matter, um, I would want much rather comment as we go along, but I kind of take notes. Now, uh, so, um, so we have that sort of ongoing commentary in, in where you may say, do you see this thread? that goes through your inventory about control, about lack of control? Do you see that, that the thing that you're most afraid of is looking bad? Do you see this? Do you see that? And that's what happens in an inventory. So uh, when, when they get into their sixth step and become willing to be rid of all of those things, or to find the willingness to be rid of those defects of character that popped up in their inventory, they know what some of those are. That's kind of a funny exercise because we don't get to choose, but at least we see the thing that's causing the problems. All right? Mm -hmm. um, don't ever sit and listen to an inventory and go, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> in case you want to <laughs> that's not good um, the, the business the same attitude that helpful and forgiving in, that you take into amends works well in listening to a fifth step also and, and here are people who are just like everybody else I mean we all come with this stuff and so we weren't uh, we weren't sparkling members of society uh, when we got to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I mean, what what the hell you think you're going to hear? You're going to hear a lot of bad news and a lot of bad behavior, and and you're going to hear a lot about people who harmed other people, either intentionally or unintentionally, and and that's what fifth steps are about. 
So you just sit there and listen to it. Now, I get accused of falling asleep in fifth steps. And uh, and actually, I'd like to. Um, <laughs> but um, falling back on intuitive thought, if you, I close my eyes when I listen to them. That's why I get accused of falling asleep. Um, jokingly. Uh, and the reason why I do that is because your intuition, when you listen to someone and you concentrate on what they're saying, or more appropriately, how they're saying it, you'll hear things that underlie what the words mean. And there are, there are really a couple of ways to listen to people. One is to hear the words, and one is to hear what underlies the words. And when you do that, you can hear what they're thinking about themselves. And this isn't a trick, and it's not some sort of special gift, or it's not anything like that. If you listen, to clo if you listen closely to what people say, you'll hear things that they don't say. No, does that sound confusing? No, you understand what I'm saying? And that, and that has been helpful to me in fifth steps because I, I want to know, sometimes people practice what uh, is called circumlocution. That's beating around the bush, right? And so they'll talk all around the subject, but they won't talk on it because they're afraid of it. And if you listen that way, you'll hear them trying to avoid the center point. And it's kind of an interesting way to listen to people. And I, I have to listen to inmates that way because they won't tell you they're afraid. And, um, and prison's a very scary place, and it's an extremely violent place. And um, and the last thing they're going to tell you is that they're afraid, and uh, they're scared to they're scared to beat hell, and uh, and they ought to be. So, and drunks are a lot like inmates. <laughs> we all run around scared. So, do you have any questions about the fifth step? It really is about sitting down and reading your inventory to somebody. Uh, pick a person you can trust. Um, um, you know, I know people that have gone and just picked out somebody in a bus station. So will you listen to this? I think that's silly. Um, one of the things that you can do by fist-stepping with the same people is to allow somebody else to really see who you are. And that's important. It's a real value to have at least one person in the world who has a complete understanding about who you are. And it's helpful, and especially if they don't reject you. Um, and they won't. So, um, so that's helpful. Okay, so let's say that you sat down and you have fifth-stepped this thing, and now you have to go home. What do you do? All right. And do what? Okay, we consider what we've done, right? We, the book talks about uh, reviewing your first five steps and to see whether you missed anything, right? The, the expression in the book is to make mortar without sand. So, so we go in there and we, we go through, uh, we review the steps that we've done so far and see if we've left something out. <laughs> Usually it's the take it to the grave stuff. Yeah. Okay? If you're going to do that, put that first. Then you don't have to worry about it all the way through your inventory. <laughs> People have this sort of aberrant behavior, what they consider aberrant behavior, and they'll sweat all the way through their fifth step and not even pay attention to what they're reading because they're afraid of what they're going to have to tell somebody. 
start out by telling them, go, hey, the worst thing in my inventory is this. And then you don't have to sweat through the rest of it. Then you can go, Shoo. That was easier than I thought it was. <laughs> and um, um, so you go home and you take the book down from the shelf. Now, see, I went home, put the book up on the shelf, and then took the book down from the shelf just so I wouldn't miss anything. Does that sound pretty silly? Uh, it sounds silly to me, and, but I did it anyway. And uh, and I reviewed the first five, what it calls the first five proposals. Um, and uh, see if I missed something. What if you miss something? What do you do? And do what? Yeah. Say I missed something. And uh, I've had those calls on occasions. And they go, I really didn't want to talk about this. That's what some of the calls sound like. Some of them are just, hey, I missed this and this. And uh, and it was just, you know, something that would have been a normal part of their inventory, so it was not a big deal. So you clean that up, and then uh, you ask for the willingness in the sixth step to be rid of those things that have kept us from the sunlight of the Spirit. All right? That takes courage. It takes courage because what you're asking God to do is to remove a part of you. Um, and some of us will get into fear and say, if all of that's removed, then what's left? And... Maybe I won't be who I was anymore, and what am I going to do if I don't know who I am? And what if that's removed? How can I? you know what most people don't want removed? What they defend themselves with. Could be. He isn't going to remove free will no matter how much you ask. Huh? Yeah. That's a gift. You got it. He's not taking it away. You make an interesting comment. Which one of you said anger? You did. Um, we spend our whole lives defending ourselves. And we're scared to death, and we need some sort of instrument to, d so we don't get hurt. We have to have some sort of methodology where we can make other people back up or get away from us. You can use anger to do that. And you can... Uh, I, I I sponsored a guy for a short period of time one time, and he went around telling everybody that he suffered from severe rage. And I said, um, I think you have a choice in that. And he said, no, I'm totally out of control. And I said, so, so it can just happen at any time with anyone? And he said, absolutely, I have no control. And I said, bullshit. Uh, I spend as much time around you as anybody does, and you don't do that with me. And he said, uh, no, I don't. And I said, do you know why? And he said, no. And I said, because you couldn't get away with it. Uh, you come at me like that, I'll kick your ass right down the goddamn block. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, rage is a tool for you. If you get in a position where you get frustrated and you want to back somebody up, you use rage. And if it's someone who can't protect themselves, they'll run away from you. And it's a mean, terrible thing to do to other people. And you have absolute control over that, and you always have, and that's true. Uh, so he didn't like that very much because he didn't want to own it. And the truth is he had been using it for years to intimidate other people. 
And uh, it's a really mean thing to do if you want to know the truth. Um, it's a lot more fun to try a resolution than beating people away from from us. So, uh, so people want to hang on when they, in the sixth step, people want to hang on to what they use to protect themselves. We do not want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be undefended. So we won't, we won't let go of those things that we have spent our lives defending ourselves with. Um, I'm, I've been a loner almost all my life. And uh, that was the way I defended myself. And so, um, and I, I, I still do it automatically. And I, there are parts of my life that I still haven't resolved. And one of those is, is being a loner. Um, I figured if you wanted to, def to defend yourself, you just don't have anybody else around you. And so, and I had an attitude. And it, when I, we had this new lady in the group and I said, how come you never asked me for help? And she said, I am scared to death of you. And I said, whatever for. I mean, I'm one of the easiest people in the world to talk to. And she said, you look so mean. And I said, well, that's kind of the way I grew up and my face froze that way. And it's never really changed. Um, and, um, and maybe I'm still defending myself with this don't tread on me look. And, and I grew up with that. I grew up with this look that said, you fuck with me, something ugly is going to happen to you. And, um, and I'm still fighting it. And I don't know what my face looks like because I'm looking from the inside. <laughs> so, um, so I try not to be that way, but sometimes our anger sort of freezes on our face. Our anger or our fear kind of freezes on our face, and it makes other people avoid us because of how we look. Okay, And that happens to me to some degree. Um, you know, most of you have come up and talked to me about something so far, which I think is great. And, and, I, and I'm not trying to avoid talking to anybody. In fact, I'm out here to do precisely that. Um, but um, we have the vestiges of our own fears following us no matter how long we're sober. Um, and that kind of don't tread on me thing that I practiced for so many years has its vestiges still in my personality. So, um, so that's that. Um, so, uh, is there any other ways that you kind of try to protect yourself that you think you ought to hold on to besides anger? Wow. Well, you're right after it, aren't you? <laughs> Are you? So, what do you do with that? Great. Um, you can't fix a problem until you know what it is. So once you know what it is and it makes you nervous, start working on it. Um, now, sometimes God has a use for that, as silly as that sounds. And so ask for God. Well, we'll talk about that in the next step. But uh, the, the trick here is to be willing to be rid of everything. Good, bad, indifferent, everything. Somebody asked me earlier, and I didn't answer the question, and the question was, should we write our good stuff, all those good things about us, on our inventory? 
I asked my sponsor that once. <laughs> and he looked at me like I just fell off a turnip truck and said, it's not the good stuff that's killing you, Bob. So um, I'm not particularly concerned about the good stuff. I'm just trying to eliminate the bad stuff. And, uh, and that sounds like kind of a one-sided approach, but, uh, but the book talks about defects and obstacles and all the rest of that and doesn't say a damn thing about the good stuff. So I have never, ever, under any circumstances, written a list of the good things about me. And you want to know the truth? There are a bunch of good things about me. And for me to deny that, as it would be for you to deny it, is like spitting in God's eye. Um, we are not universally evil people. We have good, we have bad, but it's the bad stuff that's killing me. And I need to be aware of it so God can remove it. Because I do not believe that God will remove, remove anything that I can't identify. If I can't put a name on it, it doesn't go away. Try that. Interesting deal. If you can't, if you can't put a name on it, I mean like I can't have a vague notion about something and ask God to remove it, if I don't know what it is, it doesn't go away. All right. So, so I, at the end of the sixth step, or when I've done the sixth step, have to be in a position for where I am willing to have anything, anything at all removed. I have to go in with complete willingness for God to take anything that he chooses. And then I go to the seventh step. And the seventh step uh, is where I ask God to remove it. Now, that the seventh step for me is the same position as the third step, which is that I have to go to God with the willingness to put everything on the table again and say, whatever you got in mind. That, that I will bow to God's will in every area and I will leave nothing off the table. What's this? I always get followed up on the seven-step prayer, but it says, God, I'm now ready that you have all of me good and bad. I now ask that you remove every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do thy bidding. Is there more in there than that? Amen. amen. That's the amen that everybody thinks is on the end of the third step. But see, the third step, you, you complete that prayer by writing your inventory and then fifth-stepping it and then going through six and... Seven, and at the end of seven, there's an amen. All right? So that's the end of the prayer. So, uh, I now ask that you remove every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Which ones? All of them? I'm willing to get rid of all of them. I became willing in the sixth step. Right? What's it going to remove? Right. His choice. So, I, I had mentioned to you before that, that I always felt that there were parts of my personality which were surely offensive to God. And that was being aggressive and, um, and probably a little too candid. And, uh, and maybe a little too in your face. Um, and I always thought that that, although, and, and, and frankly, some, those were some of the ways that I defended myself. And so I had these defenses, and I'm thinking if it's a defense, it's, it must be wrong. 
and uh, and God said you'd make a good platoon sergeant. Um, you know, God says I need you to go talk to someone because He won't listen to it unless it's presented in that manner. And so there are parts of my personality that I have been more than willing to be rid of and have asked with complete uh, willingness to have God take them if they were objectionable. And I still have them. And I don't beat up people or I don't harm people with them, or at least I'm not aware of doing that. It's just being a little too pushy. And I, I think that's not a very polite thing to do. And I'm wrong. See, part of this is, am I willing to change my mind? How many times have I said that today? Am I willing to change my mind? Am I willing to believe that some of those things about my personality fit God's, God's plan? Uh, and so, you know, I've had one guy that goes, that, that's not right. Uh, he said, uh, he said, uh, those are defects and you're just not willing. And my answer was, how the hell would you know? Um, which is a question that was asked to me on regular occasion by my sponsor. It was one of the best things that was ever said to me was, how the hell would you know? Because I assume all these things, and they don't, they don't work. So I say that prayer, uh, and God takes what he wants. And sometimes we'll go through that, and it seems like nothing's changed. But the question is, how the hell would you know? See, we'll all sit here and talk, and then I'm going back to Colorado. And in uh, two or three weeks from now, you may be in a situation, or I may be in a situation, and something that happened here today or yesterday will alter the way that I respond. And even though you may walk away thinking nothing's happened at all except we all sort of sat around and talked for a couple of days. Um, God has a plan at work, and I don't know what it is, but don't be surprised by it. Okay. One of the things that's clear to me today is if I continue to seek a spiritual experience, I will have one. If I continue to live a spirit or to want to live a spiritual life, I will. Um, there is no end line to this. Uh, I would like it if when you got 40 years sober that you hit the end line and then you just kick back and go, hey, I'm done. I don't have to do this shit anymore. <laughs> Uh, I'm going on vacation. I'm going on spiritual vacation. I'm going to go take advantage of somebody. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? There's no end line. I went to a birthday party the other day with a woman that had 50 years of sobriety. And I, she's in my home group. You know, it makes me one of the youngsters. So uh, I went up to her, and she's a really good friend. And I said, Lynn, um, so now do you get to stop writing inventory? And she said, no, but I'll let you know when I do. And uh, there's no end. There's no end to living a spiritual life. So this is a journey. And we just keep doing it ad nauseum. Okay? So in my seventh step, I've gone to God again, thrown myself at his feet and said, do whatever you want. I'm willing. And uh, and then he does. 
And so I don't have to be surprised at the results. I've just thrown myself open to them, and maybe God wants to move me somewhere else to have me doing something else. And that's fine. So, so not, unless you have a question about the seventh step, I'm going to start talking about amends. We made a list of all the persons we had harm, harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. The next line is, we did it when we took inventory. Right? So if you don't write an inventory, like it says in the book, for instance, if you write out of one of those things, those uh, matrices or uh, check mark sheets or whatever, uh, you are going to wind up in that process without an amends list. Um, so I've got this amends list, and I, I go through my inventory, and the next thing I do is I look at all those, all those people in my inventory or institutions or principles, and I say, where's the harm? So I have to write the harm down. Okay. Um, uh, and I have to have real harm. Um, sometimes we think that we were such bad actors that we harmed everybody and we didn't. Now, someone asked me earlier today if, if someone's on your resentment list, is there always harm? Uh, no. I don't think so. But draw your own decision. Pray about it and do what you think. Okay? I think there are some people that I was angry at that I didn't harm. Now, there's a line in the book that really creates a, creates a lot of contention. And that line is, um, something about our former ill will. And so people go make amends because they don't like somebody. Okay? So when that happens around Denver, the, the group I, ha I go to is really fundamental. And so, I mean, we all do the work once a year and we all do this stuff and we're all out there making amends and doing the rest of it. But there are a couple of groups in Denver that are even more hard-nosed than we are about all that. And what that line in the book says is confessing our former ill will. Okay? So they think that if you don't like somebody, you ought to go tell them that. That's really stupid. So I'll have all these little, all these little spiritual pipsqueaks coming up to me going, uh, I need to make amends to you. And you go, okay. And they go, I don't like you. And you go, all right. Um, uh, and and they go, no, that's it. I just don't like it. <laughs> and I'd say, well, I feel much better now. <laughs> um, and I go, w what the hell did you just do? And they said, I was confessing my former ill will. And said, so it doesn't sound like your former ill will. <laughs> um. So are you still mad at me? Huh? Well, I hope you get over it, because I know it's difficult to carry that around. Um, that isn't what amends are about. Amends are about someone you've harmed. Um, I was a bill collector in Chicago, and I had to go back to those people or everyone that I could find and tell them that I regretted having done that, and what could I do to make that right? Now, some of those people I had beaten, and um, and I'm not sure what you could... Well, a standard answer to that when I met, was making amends in Chicago was stay the hell away from me. Just get the hell away from me and don't ever come back. And um, And I have done that. And those are contentious amends. Um... You know, and some people said, well, I'm glad you're better or whatever the hell it was. But um, um, 
I had to make a lot of difficult amends. The most difficult amend that I made was to my father. My father was a chronic alcoholic and was, was angry and violent and had no second thoughts about punching the hell out of me, which was interesting because the last time I saw him alive, um, he had come to where I lived, where I worked. And the police, I was, it was a smaller town in Wisconsin. I knew everybody and all the cops and everything. And they called me up and they said, there's a guy in the bar here that we're going to arrest for vagrancy. And um, he says he's your dad. Um, and is he? And I said, maybe, if he's the right guy. And I said, that's my. sounds like my dad. But my dad lived in Illinois. And so he said that the cop said, look, Bob, if you'll come over and, and get him out of the bar, we won't arrest him. So I went over there, and here was this little old man. Now, he used to beat the hell out of me. I'd pick him up. Just grab him under the arms and pick him right off the floor. And I, I did. Put him in my car and took him home. He scared the hell out of my wife. And um, and he, I started giving him coffee to sober him up. And uh, he looked at me and he said, I want you to know something, Bob. And I said, what's that? And he said, I don't regret anything that I've done in my life. And I said, get the fuck out of my house and don't ever come back. Excuse me. So he did. And he died. Um, actually, I did see him once after that when I went and made amends. Um, when when I went through my amend, amends list, um, my my sponsor said, "What are you going to do about your dad?" And I said, "Nothing. He's the one that created all the problems. He was the violent guy. I was just a kid." And uh, he said, w w what about when you grew up? And I said, what about it? He said, didn't you tell me one time that he used to call you on your birthday? And I said, yeah, most years he did. And he said, what, what did you do? And I said, I'd hang up on him. And he would go, why did you do that? Because uh, he was so drunk. That generally, I couldn't even understand what he was saying. He slurred his words so badly. His mind was gone. And he he just made noises, basically. And uh, he said, and why'd you hang up on him? And I, I said, well, because uh, he's a drunk. And my sponsor said, yeah, you're a drunk. Um and I said, I, you know, I just didn't want to talk to him. And he said, do you know how difficult it is for a chronic alcoholic to pick out one day a year and find you and try and call you? You know how difficult that is? And I said, well, I can imagine. And he said, well, you owe him an amend. And I said, for what? And he said, for holding him at arm's length your whole life because he was a drunk. Even when he tried to touch you, you wouldn't let him touch you. So I said, well, so what do you want me to do about that? And he said, get in your car, go to Wisconsin and talk to him. And I said, he's in a goddamn army home. He's in a hospital. He's had a stroke. He's not supposed to have any continuous thought at all. In fact, they think he's kind of a vegetable. And you... Uh, you know, I, I could go to Wisconsin and tell him I'm sorry for holding him at arm's length, but he won't even understand. My sponsor said, I don't care. This is about you cleaning off your side of the street. Uh, so whether he understands or not is irrelevant. So get in your car and go to Wisconsin and make amends. So I did. And um, I went to the Grand Army home in King, Wisconsin, and I walked in, and I asked the receptionist there, do you have a, a patient here named Bob Olson? 
And the woman said, that's him right over there in the wheelchair. And I went over there, and he looked up at me, didn't recognize me or anything. And I said, I'm your son, Bob. And uh, and I said, I, I, uh, I need to talk with you. I, I'm a member of a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, part of the process of getting well, of not drinking anymore, is uh, is clearing up the wreckage of the past, and I owe you an amend, um, and I want to talk to you about it. And I wheeled him off into this little room, and I said, I don't drink anymore. And uh, he became very excited, visibly, because uh, he'd spend his whole life fighting alcoholism. And um, he was paralyzed. Um, and... Uh, and I said, so I've come to make amends, and they, I'm making amends for holding you at arm's length my whole life, and I because um, because you, you were alcoholic, and I didn't understand what that was about until I became alcoholic. And I regret having done that, and I'm willing to do anything to balance the books. Didn't have the slightest idea what that had to do with. And as soon as I told him I didn't drink anymore, he got very excited. Um, um, and then I left. And then he died. Uh, my dad died from uh, gangrene. He had uh, type 2 diabetes. And back then, they didn't know how to control the diabetes, so what they do is they kept hacking off pieces of him. They had to cut his feet off. And they talked about taking off an arm. They finally went to my Uncle Leif, the banker, who is brother, and said, um, we need to talk with you because we keep taking pieces off of him, and we're going to run out of pieces. So would you like us to do another amputation, or would you rather we just let him die? And it was my uncle's considered opinion, his brother, that they ought to just let him die. And at some level, my father knew that. And so what would happen was when anyone would come near him at the Grand Army home, he would scream because he couldn't talk. So we would scream. And he would scream out of frustration and despair. See the four horsemen of alcoholism, terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. See, despair is the worst because it shows no hope. And my father knew at some level that he was going to die and he had nothing to say about the process. And so he died. And they buried him out behind that hospital. My dad was married nine times. Women thought he was the best thing since sliced bread until they got him home. <laughs> and then it was like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> and out of the nine people, out of the nine wives that he had married, uh, he only had two children, my sister and I, and no one showed up. And actually, my uncle had called me and said, Bob, um, uh, Helen, who was his wife, he said, Helen and I are going to go to the funeral, but um, you don't need to fly all the way out here to Wisconsin. I know how you felt about your dad, and uh, we'll just represent the family out there, and don't worry about flowers or anything, all that's taken care of. And I said, okay. Now, I'll tell you a problem that arose with me, and maybe you're going to encounter this. So my uncle calls me, and he tells me, your dad just died. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Um, we'll represent the family. It's going to be a very quiet service and very quick, and that's the end of it. And I said, okay. So I get off the phone, and my wife looks at me, and she says, 
who is that? And I said, uh, my Uncle Abe. And she said, uh, what did he have to say? And I said, he told me that my dad just died. And she went, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And I'm looking at her like, for what? And uh, and she said, and I probably said something like that because she said, but it's your dad. And I said, you don't understand. I didn't have any relationship with him. I was just a punching bag when I was a kid. And uh, frankly, when my dad dies, it, it, it may just as well have been some guy that lives three blocks down the street that I have seen occasionally. But I have no emotional response to that at all. And she couldn't believe it, but she grew up and Father Knows Best. So I'm sitting there going, I must be really sick. Because I can't even shed a tear when my father dies. And I have never, to this day, shed a tear because my father died. And what I thought about, I might as well tell you about it now, was, but when my mother dies, then I'm really going to feel bad. And when my mother died, same thing. And I thought that I must really be damaged goods. That somehow, growing up, I never was connected. The wires were never connected in me for grief or loss or anything else like that. And, and I must really be strange or dangerous or some shit because I can't feel emotion about my parents. I can't tell you how many people that have said I have the same situation. I'm not damaged goods. I just never formed a normal family relationship. I lived with foster parents when I grew up, or grandparents or aunts and uncles or whatever. And, um, and so I never formed a normal family bond with my mother and father. And and so I didn't feel those emotions when they died. So if that happens to you, you're not abnormal. You just never had the comfort of a normal family relationship. Now, uh, two months ago, my oldest son had brain surgery. And he had a lesion in his brain. And the only way they could get to it was by going through the brain. So they cut a hole right up here in his head about the size of a Ritz cracker. And they went in with a scalpel through the brain to get to it. And uh, the problem with going through the brain is they don't know what they're going to disrupt. And so that we had a very, very competent surgeon who went through the brain cut out the lesion, cauterized the vessels that had created the lesion, backed out, put my son's skull back together, and hoped for the best. My son cognitively is better today than he was before the surgery. He had seizures. Um, like every three weeks before the surgery, and he's in the business with me. And all of a sudden he couldn't work because he was having seizures all the time. And if he had one while he was driving a car, no telling what would happen. So they wouldn't let him drive. In, uh, um, and the reason why I'm telling you about this set of circumstances is um, when I was in the, in the hospital, and I saw him when he came out of surgery. And he was, you know, he's all cut up. And his head was almost in a turban of bandages. And he was gone. I mean, and, and, uh, and I wanted to go hit somebody. Because um, nobody treats my kids like that. 
Um, so what I found out is that I have a normal set of emotions. Just didn't have any about my mother and father. In that, um, like most parents, I would jump in front of a bullet for any one of my kids. Well, you know, it's really a bitch growing up. Uh, especially if you're in your 70s. <laughs> so uh, I agreed to this whole damn thing in the third step. And so nobody said life was going to be simple, and when they talked about certain trials and low spots they had, they weren't kidding. And, um, and so, so what's happened? Now I have a son who has no seizures, is perfectly normal, has a nasty scar across the top of his head, so he wears a lot of baseball caps, at least for the time being, and he's back in business with me, and he's doing a great job, and he's got a good attitude. And see, when he had that lesion in his brain, if it ever started bleeding, he'd be dead in two minutes. And he had that hanging over his head for eight years. And when he and his wife went to visit the surgeon, his wife complained and said his personality has really changed in the last eight years. And the doctor looked at, looked at her in wonder and said, My God, don't you understand that he was looking at almost instant death for the last eight years? And that will change anybody's personality. And now it's changing back. So now he's free from that. That's a miracle. Uh, but it came, I'll tell you, it didn't come easily. But now I have a son that can go on about his life without all of that stuff hanging over his head. Um, anyway, uh, I made amends to my dad. I, I made a lot of financial amends. It took me three years to pay off my financial amends. Um, how are we doing here? Um, I owed a whole lot of money. I told you about my Uncle Leif saying, just pay it till it's paid. And I did that. And then one day I didn't owe anything. Um, since then, I have used the methodology that I uh, uh, paid my amends with. Uh, and, st and when I sold my business, and when I was in my early 50s, that screen printing business, um, I was driving myself nuts, and I went to work for Denver Public Schools in their adult education department and developed a program for them called Get Out of Debt, Stay Out of Debt. And, um, and did that for like three years, and that's how I got tied up with the Department of Corrections. They said, well, you come over and teach inmates that, because almost all inmates have problems with financial issues. So, uh, and I, I've trained parole officers in business skills, communication skills, time management, working for multiple bosses, God, about everything. And uh, that's how I got tied up with the Colorado Department of Corrections, and they kept finding ways to do more business with me, and that's how I got into therapy. They asked me, would you consider not only training all of our officers, would you consider uh, providing us with therapy because we don't have good providers? And I said, sure. And I said I wasn't much of a believer in it, but uh, I'd go hire some people if that's what they wanted to do. So I did that. And I started providing drug and alcohol classes and cognitive classes and all that stuff. And I'm not involved in any of it. I just run the business. So I didn't hire good people. Um, um, the, uh, I'm financially secure because I don't spend money. Um, I don't think I make a very good boyfriend because I'm too goddamn cheap. <laughs> uh, 
um, which doesn't bother me a bit. Uh, and I'm not really. I mean, I, I'm, I think I'm probably more generous than most people. And I, I spend an enormous amount of money on my kids. Uh, and I've got five of them, so... Um, um, the last amends that I made uh, uh, were to my children. Uh, had again gotten caught up in other issues, and I don't treat them badly, and they really love me. I, um, we were having dinner last night after the meeting. We went over at 10 o'clock to friendly, Friendly's and got a couple of cheeseburgers, and we're sitting over there, and my one of the twins called me. And he said they had their black and gold, their high school uh, 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 spring football game, where they really have it against each other. And it's a huge school. It's 2,500 students, and so their football team is big enough to have two teams on the field. And so... He's the starting nose tackle on defense. He's six foot three and 235 pounds, and and his brother's bigger than he is. And he said, uh, and I had asked him to call me and tell me how he did in that scrimmage. And so he called me up and he said, I got two sacks and a whole bunch of tackles. And uh, the coach said, don't get a big head because you were fighting against our second team. And um, and I said, I can't tell you how proud of you I am. And he spends a lot of time seeking my approval. And it isn't like he isn't going to get it. You know, so I told him how proud I was of him. Let me tell you something about all that and about making amends and about kids. Um, when I was a kid, people said, you got no chance. You're just like your dad. Um, you're uh, you're a wild kid. You got you're going to wind up in jail, da -da -da -da. or you're going to be wind up in a uh, mental institution. That's what they told me when I was a kid, so that's what I expected. I don't talk to my kids like that. This is what I tell my kids: You are brilliant. You are handsome. You have the world by the tail. You can have anything in this life that you're willing to work for. Your potential is unlimited. Your intelligence, your work ethic, um, everything about you will take you where you want to go. You are truly blessed. You can do anything that you set your mind to. That's what I tell my kids. And you want to know something? They believe it. I have an 18-year-old, or 21-year-old, who is a senior at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. He's on a full-ride scholarship in advanced engineering. He has never got anything but A's. He thinks he's the smartest guy in the world, and he won every math contest in Colorado. Uh, this coming year, he will graduate from Southern Methodist in advanced engineering, which is a, also a function of civil engineering, by the way. And then he's going to the University of Texas in Austin and get a law degree. Um, he will never, ever uh, lack money. He's going to have the kind of job that those Texans are going to pay him through the nose for for the rest of his life. He has everything that a person could want as a future, which includes this little Texas bluebell. Actually, she's about 5'10", <laughs> from Fort Worth, that is an absolute doll. All right. And... Um, and so he has, and she, he brought her up from uh, Fort Worth for Thanksgiving. And I walked and into my ex-wife's house, which I bought. Uh, <laughs> there's something that goes on a list. Uh, <laughs> and I said, what a stunning girl. 
and she is, and she's smart, and she's all that stuff. And um, um, I've made amends to him probably two or three times, and the twins probably three or four times, and about real issues. But um, they know that I love them. And not only do I tell them that they have the world by the tail, every time I talk to them, I tell them I love them. I honestly cannot remember my parents ever telling me that, either one of them. And so I make a point at the end of every conversation to tell my children that I love them. And that's not a casual comment, and they understand it's not a casual comment. So what happens when a kid grows up knowing they're loved, knowing they're smart, knowing they're attractive, knowing that that they truly have a huge variety of choices in the world and that their prospects are just wonderful? You know what happens? They succeed because they believe it. And see, one of the hardest things to do here is if if you don't think you can, you can't. If you think you can, or even if you think you might, you can. And we are held by all this silliness that says that we can't. And if we think we can't, we can't. So that's why I keep asking you over and over again, are you willing to change your mind? And not only go, yeah, I am, sitting in this room right now. I'm talking about are you willing to take the steps that are necessary? Are you willing to go look? Are you willing to see something different? Are you willing to think that you might be wrong? Are you willing to change? Are you so locked into who you are that you're unwilling to even consider something else? The only reason why I'm here is because it's time for a change. And not only for you, but for me. And so I hope you will. We're going to take a break. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.